My name is Steve Hernandez and I am the Executive Director of the Connecticut State Legislature's Nonpartisan Commission on Women, Children, Seniors, Equity and Opportunity. At what is the, uh, the ceremonial closing of LGBTQ plus pride in the state of Connecticut, uh, we are hosting tonight a joyful celebration of strength, tenacity and resilience, reflecting on the work of LGBTQ uh, plus leaders of color uh, tonight, we are so honored to have a star-studded cast of members of our community. Uh, we have Kamora Harrington, uh, who will be giving a presentation. I'm only going to speak of you lightly because I'm going to have each of you introduce yourself more fulsomely. The beauty of Zoom is that when you speak, you come forward. And we want uh, our viewing public to be able to see you and to experience you personally. Uh, tonight, we're going to be addressing not only people of color, uh, uh, in, from our community in what is thought as the official uh, pride and uh, gay rights movement, but we'll also address LGBTQI plus people of color, not as well known, who advocate for equality in various ways, many of whom were writers and artists. Whenever we celebrate, there is always the solemn duty to commemorate and to remember. And that's what we're doing tonight. So I'd like to welcome each and every one of you. I would also like to introduce uh, not only to the virtual space, uh, but to those of you who may not know, artist Anne Go. Uh, artist Anne Go is joining us tonight uh, for what really is a first for the commission. It is a remarkable artist, an, an artistry happening through our conversation. What's really powerful is that all of these beautiful people that will be part of this conversation tonight will be memorialized in a work of art. Anne Go is a proud Hartford native committed to uplifting the community and herself through art, self-care, expression, and safe spaces. She is determined to fortify the importance of veracity and altruism. She's a visual and performing artist who creates anything from upcycled garments to spoken word. Before she could even write her name, she was producing art. For her, art and music are like breathing. She doesn't stop to think of why she creates, she just innately does it. Inspiration can come through any and everything from fellow artists to particles of sand. Her musical style reflects exactly that, ranging from hip hop to country. And what's so powerful, um, I know that Anne is currently working as an artist in residence for Camorra's Cultural Corner and a, facilita a facilitator for Toivo. Toivo is a peer run nonprofit initiative that includes statewide classes, workshops, and a center for holistic healing and stress management. So without anything further, I'd like to welcome all of you. I am now going to turn uh, the mic over to Kamora. Kamora, I would just love if you were to introduce yourself to us and to the viewing public. I have known you for a long time and admired you spiritually probably for even longer. Uh, so welcome to this conversation. Welcome, Kamora. Yo, thank you, Stephen, um, and welcome everyone. You know, happy Pride, it's the 30th, so it's time to show up and show out. I have no idea what your plans are at 6.30 tonight, but there, there has to be some singing, some shouting. For me, I'll be listening to Sylvester, which leads to the Weather Girls, which leads to my son and I having this big, wonderful conversation about disco, because that's what we do. So I am doing this right now, and know that this is, in, in many ways, all day, every day, because we come from greatness, okay? Um, now, when, when Denise Drummond got in touch with me about a month and a half ago to discuss this, there was that wonderful first phone call that said, we want to just, you, you know, we want to celebrate Pride, and we want to discuss the history of Pride, at which point Kamora Liella Harrington jumped up and said, hey, let's discuss what's happening. So if you don't know me, hello, I'm Kamora Liella Harrington. Um, I'm a 40 49 year old proud dyke and I'm using that word right now very specifically for the audience that I'm speaking to because as I talk about my foremothers and those who come be came before me we're going to start off with moms mainly right and we're going to talk about many of these strong beautiful and amazing black women who did it and they were called bull daggers all day every day. Okay, so, so as we have this conversation and we celebrate with pride, know that as we talk about some of the adversity of what some of our mothers and fathers and siblings and just those, those who came before us, as we talk about the adversity that they faced, there's a celebration there. There's this upliftment of, and we did it, and we are still here. So when I tell you about Moms Mabley, who may or may not have been a trans man if, if she lived at a different time, but we know that that is a woman who proudly proclaimed that she was a bull dagger and the men who knew and loved her and respected her used male pronouns because that was appropriate at the time and in their situations. 
whew, we come a long way, baby. And I'm saying that with even without even trying to smoke some Virginia Slims. So welcome to this. This is a panel. Look at the folks who are here. Okay, there's some amazing human beings who are here. And every last one of these human beings is nosy and talks too daggone much. So if you ever find yourself in space with us, is it okay to just run up to a gay person and say, hello, gay person, I got some gay questions, here we go. No, that is never okay. Look at who's here, write the names down. These people are the folks who, if you come up and say, you know what, I've got some intersectional queer questions and I was hoping that I could have a conversation. These weirdo folks up in here are gonna sit down and have the conversation with you because we love this stuff. Um, and, and I love that it's 2021 because 10 years ago, as we were talking about pride, there'd be that beautiful place where heterosexual folks would come up and say, it's so good that you can be you, right? And that's great, but I think we're finding a place where we can say, no, 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 check out who we are. I don't want to be heterosexual. I want I, this community, this, this culture, this, this thing that I've got, this is where I wanna be. And guess what? There's so much that you can learn from who we are and what we've got going on, right? So welcome to, to the end of Pride 2021. There's a PowerPoint that I'm about to share. That PowerPoint was put together by Regina Dighton. And Regina, if I'm getting to a place where people are calling me elder and beautiful young people are calling me Miss Kimora out of respect, I'm going to call you with all love and respect, queer history in the state of Connecticut. And I can tell you without a doubt, no lie, no blowing smoke up anywhere. And if you wanna have, again, you wanna have this conversation, we can have it. I would not be where I am doing what I do without Regina Dighton, period. My very, 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 very first volunteer opportunity in the queer community in Hartford. So just to give you an idea that here, Stephen, you on the background on who I am. I came out as queer and I went to the gay community center to go learn how to be gay the right way. And when I got there, I was lucky enough that Regina Dighton was the executive director and they had a library and they had a room and by library, I mean, they had a room filled with books and boxes and my volunteer position for, for the first three months of being an out lesbian, young lesbian in the city of Hartford was putting together a library with all of the amazing queer books that, that the Hartford Gay and Lesbian um, Community Center had. So Regina, I know you've got to go. You've got, you're getting ready to retire from yet another job in order to go do some more work for our community because that's what you do. Um, but can you please introduce yourself and tell everyone how great you are or who you are? We'll, we'll tell them how great you are. Oh my goodness, Kamora, thank you. Over and over and over and over and over and over again. It is fabulous to have seen you, David Elliott Waterman, and so many others grow up. It's like, now I know I, well, I can retire, but I can't really retire, you know, but I could slow it down. So I'm not going to be, for everybody who's on, I'm not going to stay on because I retired today, and what I didn't know when I committed to do this was that um, co-workers, you know, become dear friends, were planning a surprise for me today at 5 o'clock. Well, when I sent out this flyer, they had to tell me. <laughs> so I'm at a restaurant, uh, pardon any background noise, but once again, I could pass it on. I contacted Kamora. And she said, oh, yeah, I can narrate that for you. So I drafted the PowerPoint. Kamora helped with some editing. I hope you like it and just have a wonderful evening event. And now that I am not working for a hospital anymore, I have more time and more freedom to just be a buck wild activist. So hit me up. No rules, no restrictions. Love y'all. Love you, Regina. Bye-bye. We're kind of awesome. No rules, no restrictions. This is who we are. This is what we do. And, and the beautiful place is that like we come from this. So as we do this, and as you see the PowerPoint, I'm going to keep going back to, we'll, we'll be talking about stuff that happened in 1905, and then we're going to be talking about stuff that happened in 2018. Take notes, keep up. Again, I, this is a celebration and th these are the people who I get excited about. Um, when I think about who I am in the world and who I could possibly be in the world and what those possibilities are, the folks who we're about to look at and talk about are the folks who get me there. Um, and folks who are on the panel, I know that we're going to have a panel. I know that we're gonna have a chance to talk and do all of that good stuff. I am getting ready to go through a PowerPoint, which means that I'm not gonna see, be able to see the rest of you, but please, 
if you got a thing to say, if you want to jump in and share something, turn your mic on, jump in, interrupt me because I get excited and I like conversations. I love to hear what folks have to say. Um, but welcome to Regina Dighton's PowerPoint on beautiful and influential black and brown queer folks in, in, in the United States, in history. And I'm not gonna keep us to the United States, but in, in history. And I started off talking a little bit about Moms Mabley. And so anyone who has ever heard of the Harlem Re Renaissance, if you study the Harlem Renaissance at all, you've heard about all these wonderful, wonderful places where people were thinking new thoughts, where the intellectuals were creating new ways of being, where new fashion was happening, cars were happening, all kinds of wonderful, great things were happening. And we were stepping into our own and seeing what that could look like. Now, before I talk about Moms Mabley as a gender bending, gender queer, beautiful and amazing human being, I need you to know that she was born in 1894 and was not the first black woman who put on men's clothing and performed. This is something that's been going on through enslavement, after enslavement, when the minstrel shows were going on all over the place. But Moms Mabley was one of our first big superstars. And when white America met Moms Mabley, they met Moms Mabley towards the end of her life. And they met this comedian who was raunchy. Please find yourself some old Moms Mabley records. See if you can find a transcript somewhere. There's a, um, a couple skits with her in Red Fox. You can definitely find Whoopi Goldberg talking about Moms and all the wonderful skits that Mom did. Um, but white America met Mom in the late 60s. Black America knew Moms Mabley way before that through her comedy records. Before she was Moms Mabley, back when she was just Jackie Mabley, she was in many of those Harlem Renaissance movies. So you saw her throwing rent parties, being a comedian and having a great time. And the big joke was this Moms character was just a character. The person out there, and as I use that word dyke for myself, was this big old bull dagger who was allowed to be the person who she was. And the wonderful interest are one of the things that I find as those wonderful, interesting secrets and, and places that we just don't see when we look at it using today's eyes. The black community knew to keep moms and her bull dagger cross-dressing self to us. And that when she crossed over into the white world and when she found herself on television, you know, on regular variety shows with white folks for white audiences, that old matronly black lady persona, her character is what was shared. We knew that there was a different moms and that moms was kind of he. Moms in order to make it in American society came, showed up in the way that America was comfortable with older black women showing up. Um, and then we've got Marsha Pre Johnson. To give everyone a second here because I think many of us know Marsha Many of us have heard of Marsha, and many of us have ideas of who this person was without really spending some time really thinking about the, what this person's life was like. So Marsha P. Johnson was born in 1945 and was a 24-year-old kid in New York City when, when it all set off and when it all happened. And luckily, she had her right-hand friend. She had her buddy. She had Sylvia Rivera. And when we think about what it is to be resilient and to make it as a queer person, there's that place of community. And when we think of where we were and where Stonewall happened and where so many of those pivotal queer events happened, we're looking at the Compton riots, we're looking at things that happened in Los Angeles, we're looking at things that happened in New York, we're looking at things that happened in Chicago. And what we need to remember and understand is that so many of us had to jump up and run away from our families of origin in order to find community. One of the beautiful things that I think we all should really think about when we think back about what Marsha went through and what Sylvia went through is that they had each other. And who are we there for? You know, this is Kimora here having this conversation. This is Regina's presentation. I would have loved to have heard how Regina would have presented it. When it comes to Kimora talking about Marsha and Sylvia, there's a big place where I want to remind us all to step back and, and just be so happy that those women, that those two human beings had each other. And then we get to Sylvia Rivera, who was Marsha's buddy, ridiculous, wildly radical transgender Latin, Latinx woman. And when Regina said that I helped out with a little bit of the editing, I shared this, this picture of um, Sylvia later in her life. We all know Sylvia, the young woman. And I think one thing that we really need to remember about our elders is that those beautiful, amazing, radical folks never stopped. It's kind of funny, Regina, right now tonight is at her retirement party. She ain't retiring. She's not, it's not going to happen. Once you get the bug, once you start like 
working for your people and creating spaces where your people can step in and see liberation, then you can't stop. And I want to remind everyone that while Sylvia is often credited with throwing that first brick, and we're going to talk about that, um, but while Sylvia is often credited with throwing that first brick, that human being did not take that as a chance and a time to sit on her laurels and just say, look at what I did. She continued fighting th throughout her life. Um, so Sylvia Rivera is an amazing woman who also made sure to say, when folks would say, hey, you threw the first brick, she would say, I don't think I did. I might've thrown the second one. I didn't throw the first one. Um, and I wanna bring up Stormy, right? So, and if you don't know Stormy Delaverry, she was, is an amazing, I'm coming back to those words and I'm sure that there are folks who are watching this who are not really comfortable with the words, um, but Stormy was a black lesbian entertainer during the Harlem Renaissance, after the Harlem Renaissance, and is in many places credited with actually throwing that first brick. The stories that we hear about Stonewall tell us that there was some, there was a butch black lesbian who was being arrested by the cops. The police were manhandling her. She was screaming at folks, telling folks, you know, make this stop. And then it started. Um, Stormy herself has said that she was the person, many people who were there, many people who had a firsthand account said that Stormy was the person who, who threw that first brick, who threw the first punch, who, who set it off. Um, and for whatever reason, this is something that's kind of debatable. I'm Kamora Leela Harrington. I'm a big old loud black lesbian who spends a lot of time saying that our stories are taken away from us. So I sit in the camp that says Stormy is the person who was being arrested and that she is the person who threw that first punch. And by her account, if you ever hear this, if you can ever find a chance, find video of this person talking about what that first punch was, she makes it quite clear. She beat up the cop, she knocked the cop down, he couldn't up, she get up, she got the better of him, he was embarrassed. Um, but Stormy may or may not have been the lesbian who threw the first punch. Regardless, she was out and proud in the 50s and 60s in New York City and was well known for fighting anyone who needed to fight, anyone, anyone who felt as if they could disparage, hurt, bash, whatever words we want to use, gay and lesbian folks in Greenwich Village in New York City during the 60s. Stormy was there ready to throw punches and ready to defend her folks so that, so that we would not continue to be bashed. Um, and I want to bring us right now to Polly Murray. And this was a fun one. So when Regina told me- Laura, that she, you yes. mind if I jump in real quick? Heck no, what you got to say, <laughs> boo? Um, yeah, so I just wanted to say that um, I love that we're bringing up all of these um, Stonewall pioneers and veterans because I think people forget sometimes um, why we have pride and why it's in the month of June. And I think that's an amazing part of our history and the people who were involved and that monumental moment. But I love that we included details about where they were after. I remember I'm with the Hartford Gay Men's Chorus and we did a show called Pride where we did look at the history. And when I first learned about STAR, um, the organization that Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera organized together and that well beyond after Stonewall, they were still helping youth get shelter, get resources. And I think it's easy to focus on these big moments of history, but it's also the people who are on the ground doing this base level work that we should also be highlighting because that gets us through pride every single day. So Stonewall got us through June and I feel like these other works are all the other months of the year where we have to remember to bring that spirit of Stonewall all throughout with us. Yes, definitely. Like like one of the, the beautiful things that we've got are the lesbian history archives, right? And we're gonna talk about who put those, we are going to get to who put those together and what that is. And this is exactly what we're talking about, this place of there's the big stuff, there's the huge monumental stuff, but then there's the everyday tedious work. And I know who's, who some of the panelists here are. And knowing that for some of those big wins, there had to be people in living rooms stuffing envelopes. There had to be people making signs. There had to be, but I'm thinking about your college years, there had to be people spending a lot of time with a lot of markers and a lot of poster board creating stuff um, and creating the signs and creating the signage and then doing those actions that at the time might, might appear to be really small, but when we step back and realize, oh yeah, oh yeah, this is what builds a movement because this is a movement. Yeah, and behind all of these faces, um, these amazing faces today, there are hundreds more um, that we aren't able to highlight, but made just as valid contributions to the movement. 
so true. But wait, since you're here right now, and we will get back to Polly Murray. And as I am getting ready, so Wu jumped in. And this is what we do, right? We got a whole PowerPoint. We can go back and forth. Um, and I want everyone to know we're going to spend some time with Polly Murray because this human being done did the daggone thing before anyone else did. But Wu, who belongs to the ISC or the Imperial, and here, I'm sorry. So cishet folks, I'm using gay lingo because I'm amongst my folks. So I'm gonna talk about the ISC, but you don't know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the ISC. So before we talk about Jose, Vu, can you just introduce, what do I mean when I'm saying the ISC and just assuming that everyone knows what I'm talking about? Yeah, um, so I am the current reigning emperor of the Imperial Sovereign Court of All Connecticut. And we are part of an international organization called the Imperial Court System. And um, it was started by this amazing, lovely human being, Jose Julio Saria. Um, and as it says, they were the first um, out gay person to run for political office. So we all know Harvey Milk, but a lot of us don't know Jose Julio Saria. And winning isn't everything, um, I'm because the courage that it took to even put yourself on that platform and run is something that we should acknowledge. And I think that's how people get lost in history sometimes. I think we focus on the major wins, but um, not always the major battles. So Jose was a battler. Um, they started um, our organization with bold movements. They're known as the Widow Norton because way, way, way back when um, there was Joshua Norton and he declared himself emperor of the United States. And no reason, no rhyme, but he did good works in San Francisco. And one day he just said, I'm the emperor and I'm just gonna do the god dang thing and that's gonna be it. So when Jose was doing fundraising, um, they said, well, um, Joshua Norton is dead. I'm just gonna go to their gravesite. Um, I'm gonna pay my respects. And someone asked who she was and she says, well, I'm the empress. I'm the Empress of San Francisco. Um, so that's kind of how the organization started. And it's um, an organization of 70 chapters now all over the United States, Canada, and Mexico. And we um, run our organizations kind of like a fun royal society. So we have everything from lords and ladies and lieges all the way up to emperors, empresses, um, and monarchs. And we just raise money throughout the year. So we've been around Connecticut for our 22nd year now. And over those 22 years, um, we've raised $300,000 and given it back to LGBTQ plus supporting organizations. And we have 69 chapters across the country that are doing the exact same thing for their local community. So the fact that this one person visited a random gravesite, um, declared themselves Empress of um, San Francisco created the second largest LGBTQ plus organization in the world is just kind of a, a really amazing thing. And, and I'm glad that we're highlighting them. Most definitely. And, and there's, there's that theme, that theme of philanthropy. And this is that beautiful place as we talk about, you know, what is resilience? What does resiliency look like? Resiliency looks like knowing that you've got to pull those behind you forward. Resiliency isn't just triumphing, tri you know, finding that place of triumph and sitting on a on a beach and saying, "Here's my mai tai. I've got my cocktail. Life is great." <sighs> triumph, that beautiful, that beautiful place in our community. The way the way you see it show up over and over is, I might have two dollars. That means I can give you a dollar fifty. I might have three dollars. That means I can give you two dollars. Um, but this is what we do, and this is what you see. The ISC is beautiful and really does collect a lot of money and gives it to many, many, many queer organizations. Um, but I did want to talk about 2015. I used to run an organization that had a summer camp for queer kids. And it was a wonderful camp where we taught queer history. We taught their history. We taught young people to step into all of the beauty who, of what they are. So as you're looking at this PowerPoint, all of these beautiful people and many, many, many more, as Boo pointed out, We've got, we've got 90 minutes. We are not getting any, we're not hitting the iceberg. We're just hitting on a few folks. But during Queer Academy, our young people all studied those who came before them. And then up in Holyoke, there is an Imperial Sovereign Court. And we were able to take our young people up to coronation. And as Boo was sharing with you, yes, it is a court system. They've got all, the monarchy is doing its thing. And the titles are ridiculous and amazing and over the top and speak to us naming and claiming who we are. So ridiculously over the top until you step back and say, oh, this is an organization that's been telling people since 1965 that you are whoever you say you are, name it, claim it, it's yours. Um, and this is what we do. Again, we're queer, so we do it in a fabulous way. Sometimes it looks a little bit 
cuter, a little bit more pretty than it might look in other places. But this really is how we care for our own, how we care for ourselves. And that is, I made it. Let me turn around and make sure that I'm bringing some other folks along with me. Yeah. And I just um, want to say and give a shout out that the current reigning empress of the Imperial Court of Western Mass is actually watching this show right now. Yes. Wait, wait. Who, who's the current empress? Um, Bella Rose Reynolds Deluxe. Hey, Bella Rose. Thank you so much. And thank you for caring community. And folks, again, if you're looking for someone to donate your money to because it's June and it's pride and you're feeling all kinds of great, give money to the ISC, to whatever ISC, whatever Imperial Sovereign Court is near you. And I can tell I can tell you that Western Mass and Connecticut do a great job of making sure they're supporting organizations that are doing good work in the community. Um, and commercials happen like that. So sorry for the commercials, but there we go. We appreciate it. Most definitely, thank you. We appreciate the work that you do. Nation, wait, internationally. I was gonna say nationwide, but then you were gonna tell me about the Canadian thing. So internationally, yeah, um, in and Mexico, right? And so, Mexico, there's a court in Tijuana, I believe. <laughs> okay, good. I didn't, I didn't want to misrepresent. Um, so we have Jose, and again, coming up to who we are. I don't, when we started, I said that I wanted us to talk about who's not here and who we are. Don't. We going back to Polly? Yeah, we're going back to Polly, but we're going to Bayard first. Since we came out of order. I feared I would do Bayard. I would talk a little bit about politics and interest, you know, and entering interest and compromises that we've made. And then I was going to get back to Polly and start talking about gender and Eleanor Roosevelt. How does that work for you, Boo? That works great for me. I love Bayard. Yo, thank you. And everyone who's enjoying, who's watching this, please, please enjoy it while we play. Again, it's Pride, it's June. We don't get this much very often. October is Gay History Month. We get kind of heavy around there. In November, Trans Day of Remembrance comes up. That's a heavy place. This is the end of Pride. And I'm happy that I get to hang out with my folks tonight. And this is actually a perfect segue because the ISC is currently working on a letter writing campaign um, to get our LGBTQ heroes recognized on a stamp, um, including Bayard Rustin, Marsha P. Johnson, Sylvia Rivera, and Jose Julio Saria. So we're trying to get all of these um, pioneers in our history on postage stamps um, so that their faces can hit envelopes and packages and travel around the country and, and show people who we are. Yeah, you, you know I will be sending those everywhere. Every, every letter that you get from the KCC, once this happens, they'll have them all. Right now, I think we're still using, who are we doing? Um, well, we've got a whole bunch of love stickers, but we, we'll get them out there once we get them. Um, but again, as we hear, so we're constantly hearing about Bayard Rustin as Martin Luther King's right-hand man. He was his right-hand man. He was the architect of the March on Washington. He truly, truly, truly was incredibly influential in Martin Luther King's life and his work. Um, and before that, so Bayard comes from a Quaker tradition and had been working in the, in a, um, had been working creating this idea of a nonviolent movement, a nonviolence type of movement here in the United States. So he was working right along in the world, work, world of human rights, in civil rights, in race work, so in Black folks' rights, um, and really working and being himself. And also, Bayard, I really love looking at Bayard because this man was a whole man. He was a queer man, he was a gay man who enjoyed having sex with other men. And I'm going to say it that way because so often when we talk about our heroes, it's important for so many of us to sanitize them. And we can talk and sanitize ourselves. And we can talk about the heroes and the great work that they did. And we can talk about their sexuality and gender in ways that are about relationships and love. And all of this is wonderful. And Bayard Rustin was a black queer man who enjoyed having sex with other men and that got him in trouble a couple times and he ended up being arrested i i want to say buggery but that's because i've been reading a whole lot about um queerness in in london recently um but he was arrested for having sex with another man in a public place which created a place where people in the civil rights movement were not were not able to support him any longer and as we talk about who's missing, I really want folks to think about the compromises that people have made. Um, I'm not asking anyone to judge those in any type of way, but I'm asking people to think about compromises and specifically compromises that black, specifically black, but black and brown, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, queer folks in the United States of America have had to make. Um, we all talk about there's no such thing as a one issue life. So, so our, we have to be intersectional, you know, our movements have to be intersectional. Um, and for many of our elders, for many of those who came before us, 
they had to make decisions on who they were going to be and how they were going to be because there wasn't space in many places. There wasn't space for gay folks. I know that when we look back and think, you know, one of the people who we think about is Elaine Locke, who was fired by Howard University in 1925 because they didn't want him to bring shame to the university. As a community, as Black, as we discuss and think about Black and Brown, queer folks in the United States of America, and worldwide actually, what compromises have folks had to make? And let's really think about that when we think about those folks who never outed themselves um, and people who may have waited until much later in life to out themselves. I can tell you as a Black lesbian right now, Queen Latifah said some stuff at the BET Awards on Sunday night. Black lesbians are going to have a whole lot of stuff to say about Queen Latifah being out and not being out forever. And we really need to think about the choices and decisions that people are making as personal decisions while they do affect all of us. And let's look at who these beautiful human beings are. The fact that they figured out how to live their lives outward or openly and how to live their lives as out queer human beings, wonderful and beautiful. And many of them had to take a hit at some point in their life. Um, let's go back to Polly Murray. I was telling you, so Polly Murray has been this beautiful human being living at the intersection of a way I like to say it, is living at the intersection of her and her forever. Polly realized, or her and him forever. Polly realized as a young person that there are probably way more masculine than many other women. And then also realized along with having this amazing mind and this amazing political mind, realized that they really were a man and did everything in their power to figure out how to physically transition and actually was the very first person who did any type of, of a chemical transition and wrote about it and lived this beautiful intersectional life as someone who was a man and knew they were a man, but knew that the world that they lived in wasn't going to create a space for this. So I'm going to invite everyone to go learn all about Polly Murray and learn about this person's relationship with Eleanor Roosevelt and with power. And when you think about the work that Eleanor Roosevelt did, you're going to think about Polly Murray and it's gonna say, oh wow, this, a lot of this makes a whole lot of sense. Um, so you've had, had a whole lot of folks who are incredibly influential. I wanna come now, Regina, I moved the, the order around just a little bit um, because after discussing Polly, after discussing Bayard, I wanted to talk about Mabel Hampton. And Mabel Hampton, was one of those folks who collected a whole lot of history and lived her life out. She was a close friend of uh, Moms Mabley. She was out there in the Renaissance, doing her thing, performing all over the place and living her life. As you hear me, I continue to use this term bull dagger. And I use this term bull dagger because that's a disparaging term that was, that was never hurled at us with any kind of love. But you listen to black lesbians of a certain age and they will tell you about their Bill Dagger self. Um, back in the 90s, Frank, and Frank is a young white um, queer person who is an artist, wrote this song called The Bull Dagger Swagger. And it was just this beautiful place of writing about and, and living a life where there was no space to be a woman who know that, knew that there were a man. There was no space to be a man in a body that people didn't want to accept and see as a man's body. And so these folks really were our tra trailblazers really did the work, laid the foundation, and left the history. So when we talk about Mabel and we talk about intersectional lives and we talk about where our history is and isn't, Mabel, as she began to get a little bit older and wasn't performing as much, she became a domestic. If you are not familiar with the term domestic, she became a maid. And she started working for white families as a domestic. Luckily, she ended up working for Joan Nestle. Joan Nestle is a white lesbian with some means who actually came together and with, with the money and Mabel's ideas and created the Lesbian History Archives. And because Mabel was one of the founders, there's a lot, a whole lot of black lesbian writings, photos, playbills. There's so much black lesbian um, memorabilia in the History Archives because of Mabel. Um, and when we look back and we look at our history, one thing that we need to understand when it comes, and definitely when it comes to the Harlem Renaissance, we don't have anywhere near as much information that's been saved, that's been archived around our men because they didn't have the access that Mabel had through the Nestle family. Um, 
but these are our heroes and they collected all kinds of great stuff. And if you ever have a chance, actually, I don't know if they're open anymore um, because of COVID, but if you ever have a chance to get to the Lesbian History Archives and you're a weirdo freak who loves this stuff like me, get down there, read what our foremothers left for us. There's great stuff down there for us. Um, and Angela Davis, so this one, oh, I wish Regina was here and I cannot wait to have the conversations. Um, and I wanna just read what, what's here in the words. So Angela Davis, incredibly influential with the Black Panthers. We, we all know about the amazing work that she's done. I'm going to just assume that everyone who's here has read her autobiography. And if you haven't read it this way, you've listened to it on audio tape because it's amazing and fantasy, or yeah, it's amazing and fantastic and really lays this beautiful idea of how movements move into movements and how movements grow and how as we as we immerse ourselves in the work in the work of caring for ourselves we end up seeing again how all struggles kind of intersect and, and how we grow out so today angela davis is doing amazing work around prison abolition and it says here that fewer people know her as a philosophy professor and a bisexual feminist now i i was under the impression that angela davis was a lesbian so i would really like to hear if anyone what um knows of of angela calling herself a bisexual woman or coming out as a bisexual woman i would love to have more of that conversation um because again it's very easy to find boxes to put folks in and it's very easy to say oh this person is a black lesbian because it's a lot easier that way um i don't want to misrepresent angela davis if she's if she's a bisexual woman and that's news to me which would be some kind of great news and hello 2020 hello 2021 James Baldwin, what does happen to a raisin in the sun? James Baldwin has been telling our stories and telling our stories from a beautiful and intersectional lens forever. Now, when we talk about stories that have been lost, again, this is, this is another one that I wanna ask. If anyone has ever heard of this story, please share it. Um, but James Baldwin lived his life as who he was as an out black man, out black gay man 24 seven. And this is a story that I've heard. It's one of those beautiful stories, or one of those interesting stories. At his funeral, there were all of the wonderful things that were happening. People were saying, you know, platitudes, memories, everything was being shared. And at one point, no one had mentioned anything about his sexuality. And someone stood up, that person stood up and felt the need to say very loudly. And he was a proud gay man. And the room shifted at that point. Whether that happened or not, I'm not sure. I'd love to hear more about that. But again, that story highlights how so many of us, regardless of how we live, so going from Angela Davis and, and not really knowing what's going on there and being over here with James Baldwin and knowing that even when we shape our story, when we try so hard to share who we are authentically, very often, just like with Bayer, just like with so many other folks, when we pass, when we die, when we're no longer here, the people who are left wanna sanitize our stories and fix them. Depending on what the story is that's the acceptable story at the time, you may be fixed in a way that you would like, you may be fixed in a way that you don't like. James Baldwin luckily was able to write enough and left enough of a history and a story behind him that no one doesn't know that he was an out proud black gay man. Many of our elders who came before us who lived their lives openly have kind of been closeted again after death. That's that's a thing that kind of happens. Hey, Kamora? Yes. Max is here. I want to I want to engage in some anti sanitizer with you a little bit since you said what the word. You and I want to give it to you now. Um, Maxie Stendhal's here. I'm, um, I work in New Haven, grew up in snobby Fairfield County, but I pretty much try to cover as much as new, uh, as much as connected as I can advocacy for specifically centering undocumented uh, Latinx youth. But I, I wanted to basically bring to you a name that not many people know, a really important name to me, because the way I cut my teeth in this work is in HIV work. And, um, and this name is a uh, name of young and named Robert Rayford. A lot of me, me, people may not necessarily know this name, but because uh, they may know names such as Ryan White, but Robert Rayford was the first can you young- please, Can you please spell Robert's last name because I'm writing it down because I'm going to be looking him up when we're done. Yep, absolutely. All of you, here we go. R-O-B-E-R-T, Robert Rayford, R-A-Y-F-O-R-D. Robert Rayford was a 15-year-old man who was admitted into uh, St. Louis Hospital. Uh, St. Louis City Hospital in 1968. He came down with a mysterious pneumonia that not many people understood. Six months after, 
uh, he deteriorated and died. He died in 1969. This was one month before the Stonewall riot. It was not until 1981 that his, some of his tissue sample was collected and compared with other uh, men, gay men actually, who died of AIDS. And it was understood that it was Robert Rayford. Robert Rayford, a 15 year old young man from St. Louis, who was the first one to come down with HIV that we know of. And not many people know his name. And I think it's so important that you were just talking about sanitizing our history when you're talking about washing the history that really is ours, really. In many cases, when I say ours, I mean queer folks of color. This is our history, what's really everyone's history. But how is it that we don't know Robert Rayford's name? I was on the Ryan White Planning Council. Well, I am on the Ryan White Planning Council for New Haven and Fairfield Counties. And many of the folks who were on that council themselves didn't know this young man's name. And so I think it's just so important for us to be able to understand who these folks are, especially when we're talking about the history of Stonewall. It's no mistake, it's really no mistake that I was at the Queer Liberation March this Sunday. And one of the leading organizations that ensured that, ensured that we keep us safe, that it's not the cops that keeps us safe, it's we who keep us safe, it was ACT UP. ACT UP, the original Tell us about ACT UP. Tell us about ACT UP. I don't have a slide. Who well, was ACT UP and what did they do? ACT UP. ACT UP was the um, AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, an organization that basically made sure that there was a pill in my hand as an HIV positive man of color myself, that there is a pill in my hand that I could take every day and I myself won't have AIDS after I have HIV. ACT UP was the organization that put their, put their lives in front of pharmaceutical companies, do die-ins, they construct, they did in front of pharmaceutical companies to ensure that they would push trials because we were dying, because gay men, because lesbian women, because queer folks were dying. And that's why they unleashed this power to ensure that the CDC and that the FDA and that all these institutions that were watching us die did something, that they did what they promised what they were supposed to do. And ACT UP was an organization that did that in the 80s, in the 90s to this day. They're ensuring spaces for queer liberation. So I just think that that's such an important name for us to know because it ties to what you're talking about, Kamora. And I love you so much. I love you too. And thank you because you gave me a name to write down. Um, and as you were talking about that, it's like, so first off, I did not know that. So thank you. And that is why we need to have these conversations. So pride is wonderful. It's really great. And, and, and something that I've been saying a lot lately, I find myself saying, be less cool, right? Just be less cool because I didn't know this, Max. And I could have been like, yeah, 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 and would have missed some very wonderful and valuable information. So I wrote Robert Rayford down, and I will be talking about this human being as I learn more about him. And I will be thinking about him and talking about him and R Rosa Parks and Ryan White, because as we think about that sanitized history, the folks who are sanitizing the history are often us. And we are choosing to, to sanitize history for whatever reason. We've always got great intentions behind it, but when we step back and really look at it, it doesn't serve us well in the, in the long run. So I am really looking forward to finding out more about this 15 year old, um, Max, you say young man, I'm Kamora, I've got to say child, um, but I'm looking forward to learning a lot more about this child from St. Louis. Uh, and, and this is like, what, this is 20 years before GRID? About six, about almost 20 years before GRID was called GRID. And before yep. it was, it's, it was great. It was gay related. What was it, Max? Indeficiency, uh, gay related indeficiency disease. And, and again, if you can get your hands on any retrospectives are amazing and wonderful. If you can get your hands on any queer literature that was written in the early 80s as we were trying to figure out how to take care of ourselves, you will see resiliency in ways that you, you've never seen it before. Um, very often when we were first starting to talk about putting this together and we were talking, they were talking about gay and lesbian history, I was like, look, we didn't even like each other until the Daughters of Bilitis and, and the Mattachine Society realized they had to come together for a minute and then HIV AIDS brought us together. So our history, what we've washed out, what we've sanitized, that doesn't help us as we move forward. Thank you so much, Max. Oh, yes, Carly. Your hand is up. Was Carly's hand up? Yeah, my hand was up. And yes. I want to thank, uh, Max, I want to thank you for sharing that history. By the way, Carly Webb, my pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm an organizer with the, with the Party for Socialism and Liberation here in Connecticut. I'm also a staff operator for Trans Lifeline, and I'm a writer contributor to Outsports. But 
I would just want to thank Max for that history because I have a story that involves a piece of my personal story involves ACT UP because when when I was in college, I volunteered in a hospice. I saw people die. But at the time when I was in college, I did not know that someone close to me was HIV positive. And I didn't find that out until 20 years later. But because of people, because of ACT UP, dressing up like skeletons on streets across the country, even in my hometown, Omaha, Nebraska, and speaking truth to power and going up to the FDA and throwing their bodies in the Lincoln Tunnel and blocking the access routes into New York and and the the actions on Wall Street and on St. Bernard's Cathedral and at Capitol Hill. Because of those actions, the first trials happened in 1993. The second set of cocktail trials happened in 1995. In that second set of trials for the second generation AZT cocktail was a man named Carl Edward Webb. That man is my father. Thank you, ACT UP. You gave me my dad back. Thank you, ACT UP. Carly, thank you for sharing that. And that's, that's what we do, and that's, that's what this is. And, and as I said, when we started this, um, Steve, you, you asked for stories of resiliency and such. My sister just shared some truth, and I know this woman, and I love her, and this is the first time that I've heard this, and I can't wait to... to to wrap my arms around her and have this conversation. But what does resiliency look like? Where does it come from? It comes from creating places of safety where we can be ourselves and expand and grow and be there for each other. And I know, and, and Carly, you and I have done this and uh, other folks here, I know you've done it with each other and I know that I've done it with many of you. It is rough being black and brown and queer. And you know what? <laughs> I appreciate each and every last one of you because when I've had enough, I can call you and the resiliency is there because when I am done, you're there to carry me and we can continue the work. When you are done, I am there and the work keeps happening. So what is that resiliency? The resiliency happens because we are here. Some of us have to do it and we love, like, and can respect each other in the work. I know this is life, a lifetime of work. And we got folks like James, like, come on, you can read some James Baldwin, you can get something, you can show up the next day and do some work. So Carly, thank you for sharing that. Um, and I wasn't, quite sure what's the name of the cathedral and I should probably know this but when ACT UP showed up and completely showed out on Easter Sunday what church is that I believe that's St. Paul's yeah St. Pat yeah wasn't that St. Patrick's, Patrick's in New York yep it sure was killing us that's what they kept yelling <laughs> go get your hands on video go find some articles but check out that one very important action that action just Many of the people who took part in it, their families wouldn't deal with them afterwards. They brought shame on their family. People were embarrassed. People lost their jobs and it created change. So when we talk about what this work looks like, this is dangerous work. This is hard work and it's necessary and beautiful and wonderful. Um, let me see how you... To add on to the Act on act Up Love a little bit, um, Act Up was huge in my um, early activism days as well at the University of Connecticut, we had a, a group, um, it was called Quad Queers United Against Discrimination. And we drew upon all of those protests and those bold moves that ACT UP did um, when we did our own. So um, we did a protest against the, the gay blood ban um, with the Red Cross. And we um, said our blood is in the dumpster. We literally um, put fake blood all over ourselves and stood outside dumpsters all over campus. Um, we did cemeteries of hate speech where we would put derogatory terms on tombstones and, and put our dead bodies out there for people to see. So um, I think that's where um, knowing our history also helps because, because these, these things work and, and, mm -hmm. and um, we sometimes need to kind of get back to that grassroots, especially nowadays when, when things are getting a little bit crazy or a lot of bit crazy again, um, it's time to, to act up basically and, and remember um, what, what got us there. Yes, showing up in boardrooms is incredibly important. I am so happy for all of us who can show up in boardrooms and being outside of those boardrooms, making the people inside incredibly nervous and very uncomfortable is just as necessary. Um, 
and thank you to everyone who's done that before and who continues to do the work. And I want to come up to Michelle Cliff right now, who is a Hartford person. So Michelle Cliff taught at Trinity College in the 80s and 90s and was one of those. For, so for me coming out and coming up, there was the, oh, wait, these amazing books were written by a lesbian right here in Hartford. Wait, someone, some, wait, someone in, in this three block radius wrote this stuff and it's legitimate and it's real. And please look at the PowerPoint right now. Take a look at Michelle, take a look at Michelle Cliff. That's a proud Jamaican lesbian woman. Think of the crap that she got in many, many circles. Think of the places where all of her identities were challenged. And this woman continued to show up as herself. She moved on up to Northampton, Massachusetts. So if you remember in the 90s, um, somehow someone counted in Northampton, Massachusetts had more lesbians per capita than any other town in anywhere in America. So they all flocked. Smith College definitely had something to do with it. And Michelle is one of those badass dykes up there writing, editing, and producing, and getting so much amazing, wonderful lesbian literature out there. So again, as I talk about that library that I got to put together, there are a bunch of Michelle Cliff books up in there and books that had that that she had blurbs in, books that she had reviewed. This woman was this great American, this great Afro-Caribbean, African-American woman who in many places were not, was not seen as a lesbian. So she would constantly have to proclaim that she was a lesbian and in many places was not seen as a black woman. So it also then have to remind people that she was also a black woman and continued to show up for us and challenged people just by Michelle being in spaces, challenged people's ideas and notions of what it meant to be a black woman, what it meant to be a lesbian um, and just what it meant to be a human being. So thank you, Michelle. Um, and another beautiful foremother, Lorraine Hansberry. And this was fun. So you'll see for a whole bunch of these folks, there's a whole bunch of different photos. Lorraine Hansberry, I, I came up with, there's the photo that Regina put up. My favorite photo is Lorraine with her typewriter. Um, and Lorraine Hansberry, young lesbian who, who this, this earth, this lifetime was too much for her. So she decided it was time to go and she left, but she left us with so many beautiful thoughts and ideas. And I talk about that place of sitting there and fantasizing, read some Lorraine Hansberry and get to that place. And again, as we think about who our pioneers are, she gave us so much and being here was too much. So she decided when it was time to stop being here and she stopped being here. As we think about who we are, greatness leaders are beautiful people. It's kind of rough to be black and brown and queer. It's kind of tough to be a human thinking expansive thoughts of liberation in a world that's this world that refuses to see one, two or three of your identities and guess what, they're all here. So Lorraine Hansberry, amazing, wonderful, wonder mother, sister, ancestor, woman who came before us. Now, this is the fun one. And this one I'm looking forward to talking to Regina about because this is Dan Choi who, who did a great job fighting against don't ask, don't tell so that queer folks could fight in the military. And this is amazing work that if, when you read this man's story, when you actually, when you watch some of his videos, you'll hear about a human being who still to this day is harassed and bashed and gets all kind of crap and nonsense for basically standing up and saying, allow me to be exactly who I am in all the ways, places that I can do this in a military that didn't accept his sexual identity, the way he shared his gender, um, his racial identity, all of these different things that came that created a place where a lot of folks didn't have space for Dan, created a place where Dan said, you know what, they're not going to like me anyway, let me fight this big fight for everyone. Um, and I want to remind folks that Stonewall, as many people say, you know, the first pride was a riot, Stonewall started with a riot. I want to remind folks of our, our fight here as queer folks in the United States of, of, of America, and for a very long time, we were not fighting to jump into the military. We're fighting to destroy the prison, the military industrial complex. So as we look at what our work is, and as we look at the intersectionality of our work, I find that, and, and so again, this is, this is Regina, so I'm pushing it on Regina right now. I love this PowerPoint. I love that Dan is here, and I love that it is right here because it gives my, me a chance to say there was a time when there was a huge, huge, huge arm of the queer movement that was saying, they won't allow us into their military. We are perfectly positioned to destroy the military industrial complex. We are here to say, you know, we don't want to fight your wars. We can do something else. Somehow, as we talk about that sanitized thing that happened, 
for many of us who are fighting for liberation, we're fighting to not die. We were fighting to not be castrated. We were fighting, you know, as, as lesbians, we were literally fighting to not have lobotomy so that they wouldn't cut our brains up so that they would, you know, somehow if we got a lobotomy, we were going to be straight. That's what we were fighting for and against. Somehow that turned into a fight for marriage and the ability to join the military to fight for this country that doesn't afford us all our rights. History has been sanitized. As I said, there are all these beautiful human beings who are here in this, in this conversation. Please come find us, please have the conversations and please push the conversations in all of the many different places that they could possibly go. Um, so we're getting ready to end this one. So I have never heard of this human being before in my life. I love me some Regina Dighton because again, afterwards in a couple of days, Regina and I are gonna talk, we're gonna talk about how tonight went, you know, there's gonna be the criticisms, there's gonna be the yay, come more, you did great, all, all that good stuff is gonna happen. And then I'll be like, tell me about this human being. So I don't wanna pronounce his name incorrectly. I think it's, it's Yoni Noguchi. Um, if anyone knows if that's right, please let me know if I'm wrong, please correct me. But check this human being out. So in keeping with pre-missionary Japanese tradition of sexual fluidity, this human being lived openly in San Francisco in the early 1900s, loving men and women. And the fun part, especially like right now, is this is so this is Connecticut. So I'm really thinking about uh, marijuana becoming recreationally free and legal tomorrow. And if we all know about Richard Nixon and his wonderful research around marijuana, this is just funny for me to learn about this week. But Richard Nixon called this man the most faggy goddamn thing you could imagine that was San Francisco crowd. Wow. Who are you and how do you live? If Richard Nixon what says- you What a compliment. What a compliment. <laughs> right? Like, I'm in love with this human being. Varun, have you ever heard of him? No, but I'm gonna look him up now. Yo, Richard Nixon calls you the most faggy goddamn thing you could imagine. That's gonna be deep. So, happy Pride. I'm happy to have introduced you to some folks. I introduced you to them incredibly quickly. Hopefully there's some folks out there who, as I was talking about folks, you were saying, and she left out this, and she left out this, and she left out this, and she left out this. Awesome. Let us know, let everyone know, and let's keep learning about our folks. So Stephen, here you go. Let me stop sharing. And what's next? Kamora, thank you so much. This was just so beautiful. And it shows something about community, which is really remarkable, especially for communities that are marginalized or silenced, which is that we pass on our history through spoken word. And this was just a beautiful expression of how it is that we have collected our stories, we've collected our memories, and we pass them on to each other. And we do it with love. Sometimes we do it incompletely. Sometimes we do it by necessity. We, we do it quietly. We whisper it. But every now and then we remind ourselves that we have to yell our histories toward each other so that we can remember them and they can be heard. So with that, I just want to thank you, Kimora, uh, both you and of course, uh, Regina, just for bringing this gorgeous presentation to us. I want to open up the floor because I would love for us to continue to reflect. We kind of already started. We couldn't, we couldn't, um, we couldn't help ourselves. So we started already kind of reflecting on some of what we saw. Um, but I'm, but uh, um, uh, firstly, I'd like to welcome each and every one of you. Uh, as, we, as we said, our panel includes uh, Carly Chardonnay Webb. W welcome, Carly. We also have Varun Katar Sharma. Welcome, Varun. So good to see you. And Go is still um, uh, committing uh, a beautiful work of art as we continue our conversation. Max Cisneros, welcome, Max. Good to see you again. Uh, Rahib Ali Brennan, who is our state rep. Uh, who is joining us, also a member of our community. Welcome, Rahib, uh, and Chevelle Moss Savage. Welcome, Chevelle. I'd like to open the floor to you, and, and please, let's have this conversation continue to be the way it's been. Let's not make it so formal. Um, I'm just going to recognize the first person that I see on my, on my list here, based on the order in which I see you, and that's Carly. Welcome, Carly. Can you reflect with us on some of what you've seen and what you're thinking right now? Well, first off, it's good to be here tonight. Um, first thing is, you no, know, Kamora giving us that history lesson that we need, because if you don't know where you've been, you don't know where you're going. And we have, and we have come a long way. There's a lot to celebrate. Like I was telling Max about ACT UP. It was because of ACT UP. And it was because of Bayard Rustin. It was because of, Mar of Marcia and Sylvia. And it was because of so many people whose names we do not know. 
and whose names are not in the history books and whose names and we're going and and I'm going to speak it since I'm in a black and brown house tonight whose names that are cisgender black and brown families are sent my cisgender black family and and my and my cisgender Latina Latina family do not say and we need to say black and brown it's time to bring it down it's time to come together cis black folk where you at cis brown folk where you at we need you because Stephen, there was something you said um there's something you said talk about this as a celebration and pride is a celebration but at the same time well well you know while i'm gonna be out here while i was out here you know you know shaking it and get my little sip on here and there you know um my heart is sick and sad my heart is sick and sad that the Equality Act is still being blocked by a certain man from Kentucky. Move, Mitch. Get out the way. Get out the way, Mitch. Get out the way. The work is not done. In fact, it's just beginning. Do you have shoe leather? If you do, we must be wearing it out. If we want the Equality Act passed, it's not going to depend on 60 votes. It's going to depend on 60 million queer feet marching up to Capitol Hill if need be, marching up to Mitch McConnell's face and moving him out of the way and saying, you will not get in the way of our liberation. How can I really celebrate when I know that in 33 states, in the in now up to 37 states in this union, there is legislation either pending or passed that will hurt that will hurt what the great texas activist monica roberts called our younglings young transgender kids who just want to go to school and they just want to live and they just want and if and if they choose to they just want to engage in that most american of things being able to represent my school on a ball field it doesn't get much more american than that and you know a lot of people are talking about i'm just going to say it to a black person who's seeing their votes ta being taken away, what is your 4th of July? Yes, my inner Frederick's coming out tonight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To a brown person who had to flee their country because the United Los Estados Unidos saw fit to destabilize it, and you're now in a detention camp, what is 4th of July to that person? To a transgender American, yeah, that's me too. What is your 4th of July when in 37 states in this country you're telling me you have no rights by which I am bound to respect? If we go too far, I'm going to need a green book to drive home to visit my mama in Omaha. Let that sink in. It's 2021. To any queer American, what is this 4th of July when we know that a law to codify our rights as rights inalienable from Maine to Maui is being held up by the very same people who were waving a Confederate flag in Capitol Hill on January 6th. Just remember, my people, the same people that are getting you scared just because just because Andre and Terry just want to represent their school. The same people that got you scared about that are the same people that were storming Capitol Hill and acting, a, and acting a fool. They're the same people that because you came out and voted, they now are saying, no, we got to secure the vote. No, secure the vote means too many of those black and brown people voted. Let that sink in. So to me, Pride 2021. Oh, and, what is, and one more thing. What is... What is your 4th of July to the families of 600,000 Americans who are dead now because of official indifference during this coronavirus crisis and millions and millions more who might die because some people are saying some people are saying, well, I don't want to wear a mask. I don't want to get vaccinated because some people want to be so dang selfish. What is your 4th of July? Carly, thank you, so, thank you so much for that. You know, Kimora, your journey through your PowerPoint revealed something to our viewers and us here and reminded us that our liberation as a community and as communities is one of struggle. 
it's one of pain and it's one that continues. So Chevelle, I wanna talk about that a little bit because there are long-term consequences to having to constantly struggle, right? Whether it's for rights, whether it's to be seen, to be heard, to be acknowledged, and by the way, to not be hurt. So Chevelle, I'd love to hear from you a little bit about what that means for our community. Sure. Um, thank you. So for so, I know some of y'all, but some of y'all do not. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of history about who I am as a human. My name is Chevelle Moss Savage. My pronouns are she and her. I am a dark skinned, black, fat, cis, queer, femme woman who is an activist for all issues that affect my community. My mere existence is an act of protest. So just let y'all know about that. Okay. Thank you for the invitation to be here, um, Stephen, as well as Denise. Um, in my paid position, I'm a licensed psychotherapist um, with a practice in downtown New London. So that is probably why um, Stephen asked me um, about this particular question. I created my practice um, because just as I listed my intersecting identities at the start of my share, I recognize that we are not one dimensional beings. So when accessing therapy, you need a mental health professional who can affirm all of who you are, right? All of your identities when navigating their, you know, your healing journey. Journey. I always joke that um, when I started my healing journey, I found someone who could affirm me being black or who could affirm me being queer, but could affirm both. So like either I have a white person who understands my queer journey, but when I talk about a big mama, she don't know what I'm talking about. And I'm like, that's my grandmama, right? Or when I talk about a cookout, she don't know that that's a barbecue. So that's kind of where I am with that. Um, once again, thank you for the history because um, it is a perfect time for me to pivot. Um, right now, I'm excited that we are naming all of our pioneers in the struggle. I also have the, um, the privilege of serving on the board of directors for OutCT. Um, and I am also the org's education committee. On Monday, um, June 28th, we had our second annual Everyone Deserves Pride Vigil, which honored um, our black and brown, queer, trans, non-binary folks for the selfless activism, right? Who came before us because without them, as we have talked about today, we would not have a pride, right? And what that looks like. But also we honor the people who were taken from us so soon, right? Such as our black and brown women of color who are trans and that for some reason, this country thinks that they're dispensable. So I just wanna honor that. And that happened on the um, New London, um, uh, New County of New London City Hall steps. Also, I want to name that I'm the only queer black therapist in New London. If y'all know of another one, please let me know so that we can have coffee. But I mean, at the end of the day, that what does that say? Why is that the case, right? There are plenty of queer white folks, but there are not any black folks and representation is important. You want to go to somebody who you feel affirmed and supported by, just like you said, Stephen, at the end of the day, how can you navigate all of these things that we have to navigate? Racial trauma, um, social unrest, of seeing black and brown people dying, dealing with a pandemic with so many um, health inequities. How do you navigate all of that and still try to be safe? You find someone who you can support, who can support you and share and, 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 and tell you that it's going to be all right, give you tools and tips, especially in a pandemic. I know we're on the other side. We're coming on the other side. I got vaccinated. I got my microchip. That's shaved because I know a lot of people. <laughs> but at the end of the day, I understand that folks have to make their own decision when it comes to what that looks like for them and their family. So the little part that I can do to support and affirm, I continue to do it. And thank you for having me. Thank you, Chevelle. And I want to I want to come back to you because I think, you know, the, in the solemn act of remembering, there is also, we also have to recall that there is a solemn duty of continuing the struggle. And we have to have each other's back in that struggle because it is painful, it is a long journey, and it's gonna continue way, way after we're gone, as we know from our foreparents who've come before us. So thank you for that, Chevelle. Yeah, you know, Representative Rahe Bali Brennan, you know, what's interesting is that you as a leader are emblematic of those leaders that the moment you hit the ground running in this legislature, you started advocating for our rights and for the things that our community needed. Tell us a little bit about what it's like to be a leader in this space and to be among the few uh, who is out proud and struggling along with us. Well, thank you, Stephen, and thank you guys for inviting me today. Um, I'm State Representative for Heb Ali Brennan. I represent the second district, which includes my hometown of Bethel, part of Danbury, part of Reading, and part of Newtown. Um, 
you know, I am the only openly gay legislator of color in Connecticut's General Assembly, and I'm only I'm one of two openly gay representatives in the entire state house. So, you know, I have a profound connection to the principles of pride. And, um, you know, I always do talk about what that means to be, you know, a legislator who's gay and the responsibility of carrying all those voices and, and those, um, you know, those issues, you know, on, as top, on top of, you know, the issues I have to carry for my district. And so, you know, when I ran for office, you know, there was always like, oh, he's the gay representative. It's like, no, I'm a representative. I happen to be gay. I'm going to champion these issues, but I'm also going to champion, um, you know, my districts as well. And I, there is a way to, to do that. I can talk and, uh, you know, walk at the same time. And um, that's kind of what we've seen. But I just think it's it's been amazing to, uh, to work with Jeff Curry, who's another state representative. Uh, he's been openly gay and he's been fighting for a long time. But um, you had to have thick skin. You know, I did face a lot, you know, crap on the internet from, you know, social media, from the trolls, uh, you know, since I ran in 2016, um, I lost and then I ran again in 2018 and we won and then we won again by a bigger margin. So um, my district leans a little to the right. So it kind of tells you, you know, just how tough it can be back in this area. But we've been, done a lot to make sure that Connecticut is a leader across the country and making sure that we're protecting as many rights as we can. Um, to counter what we've seen the past couple of years with the national level and um i do struggle you know with just sometimes if it's like too much am i am i doing too many things that's like you know i'm now i'm posting too much about um how much i'm doing for the gay community and not enough for for bethel or danbury and so you know those things i battle with every day but um i do have a supportive system up here and it kind of just you have to kind of just trench on and um the real support is that i've i was a member of triangles community center on their board so i saw the work that the important work that you know, organizations like that do. Um, one of the most proudest moments of my career so far was, you know, passing a bill that established, a, you know, LGBTQ health and human services network, which basically means that, you know, the gaps that there are across the state, um, we're able to basically help fund and, and figure out where those gaps are and, and fill that. And so that, you know, we're not losing people, we're not losing resources and that our community has what it needs. So um, it is an intense double act, but, you know, I, I think it's people like you guys that are really on the ground pushing the message. I'm just here to support, make sure that you guys have the resources and that, you know, we're just um, pushing up against what's happening on the national level. So um, couldn't be here without you guys and you guys lift me up. So I appreciate it. You know, thank you. Thank you, Representative. You, you mentioned the word intense. You mentioned lift me up. You mentioned double act. And it's reminded me, Shavella, what you said about how it is that we are forced to wear those different identities and negotiate between those different identities wherever we may be uh, and pulled in different directions at times that can be painful by the way. You know, there's a, there is a particular privilege which I, all, I often think about, which is the privilege of being born into the world where everything you are told is going to happen happens exactly the way you're told it's going to happen. You know what to expect when you go to school, you know what to expect when you graduate, what to expect from your parents, from your community. You are lifted every moment of your day. That is not the case for so many of us. We were born into the world where everything we are told is actually the opposite sometimes of what we actually experience. And that can be jarring, but look how powerfully people in our community can navigate that contradiction. But it's difficult and we do have to have each other's back. So thank you for doing that for so many of us representative. Uh, Vu Tran, you know, the Rainbow, the Rainbow Center, first of all, all the work that you do with the Imperial Court, thank you so much for that. You know, raising resources, bringing together, finding joy and also finding community. But the Rainbow Center, I have to think about um, uh, the annual True Colors Conference and just the Rainbow Center as a center of gravity for safety, uh, for reflecting community, for bringing young people together year after year. Tell us a little bit about what it's like to be part of that center of gravity and, and you yourself being a, an usher in that work. Um, yeah, I love my time at the University of Connecticut and at the Rainbow Center. Um, I remember when I first um, got on campus and I was looking for a job and all of the cultural centers were there. And that's where this intersectionality piece comes in a little bit because there was the Asian American Cultural Center and then there was the Rainbow Center. I was like, now what do I do? And then I learned that there was already a Boutran at the Asian American Cultural Center. And I said, let's go over to the Rainbow Center. Let's add one there. It'll work out perfectly. And, and it did. And um, the, how I, um, I guess, choose which, which bucket to fill at any certain point of time is I look at what needs it. And at that point in my life, 
<clears throat> I just come out in high school, um, probably a few months before I got to campus. Um, I was a very um, young, green, gay person, not really um, knowing anything except for my personal attraction to men. Um, I didn't know anything about the movement, anything that we were doing. Um, and the Rainbow Center was a place for me um, to learn, to be with community, to be educated. Um, and uh, over the years, I became um, their educational outreach coordinator. And one of the projects that I was um, tasked with was running our Speakers Bureau program. And uh, in that program, we would gather um, four to five LGBTQ plus students, and um, we would volunteer our time and go into classes and tell our stories. Um, and so you would have these lecture halls of 300 um, college freshmen, many of them not knowing a gay person ever in their life and us being their first introduction and the pressures of that and, and um, finding the, the strength and courage to only speak your own voice and, and having that be enough. Um, and um, the True Colors Conference there every year, I mean, it was gay Mecca. It was kind of the oddest thing you would ever see in the world that on this college campus in um, Farmtown, USA, Stores, Connecticut, um, and having 3,000 little rainbow children um, walk through a student union while there's a final, a, a W, um, a women's basketball um, elite championship game going on at Gamble Pavilion. And all those interactions was, was something enjoyable to see and something that's great to see. And in my junior year, I was the first homecoming king um, that was openly gay at the University of Connecticut. Um, and so that was a great platform for us to, to, they called me the rainbow king on campus. And I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it was a platform and it allowed a lot of people to hear my voice. And uh, the, the, the sovereign court works the same way. We wear crowns and jewelry and all this other stuff and become flashy, but it's really a way for, for, for us to have people hear our voice. Yeah. Um, because visibility is important, representation is important. Um, I was the first out gay cheerleader at the University of Connecticut also. Um, so just finding ways to, to get a, a face out there so that our community feels seen and feels that we're, we're part of this overall bigger picture because we are. Um, whether or not we say it out loud or, or whether or not we are able to, um, we are out there and their experience is just as valid as someone who's, who's on a big platform. Thank you, thank you, Vu. And th there's a torch bearer uh, and a torch bearing, I think that happens that you're describing, which is so powerful because that torch is a light, right? And it's a light for all of the young people that, that you were, um, that you represented, that you were able to, um, uh, to bring together in fellowship while you were at the university and beyond. And now in the work that you're doing now uh, in continuing that legacy of torch bearing, which is really, uh, really powerful. And you know, when you think about torchbearing and you think about those moments of transition, right, that each of us has to go through from being that kid at home that may have a welcoming home, and by the way, may not, and very likely does not, uh, and being able to come into new environments and hopefully find opportunity, hopefully find spaces where you are, uh, where you are held closely and, and lifted up at the same time where you can find community, I think about the work that you do, Varun uh, Katar Sharma, because you know, uh, with Connecticut students, um, uh, students for a dream. And what's really interesting about your work is that not only are you bringing in uh, young people and understanding the the uh, sort of the the ways in which young people want to find their place right here in this new environment and these new cultures, but also those young people who may be. Uh, diverse, the way all of our community is. How do you uh, bring your worlds together in the work that you do now, Varun? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'm Varun. Um, I use he and they pronouns. Um, just to briefly introduce myself before answering your question. Um, I'm brown, I'm queer, I'm not binary. I'm Punjabi, proud to be Punjabi. I'm proud to be a survivor of sexual violence. Um, and um, yeah, and, and as, as Steve had mentioned, I work, um, you know, I'm a facilitator, I'm a writer, I'm a community organizer. I work for Connecticut Students for a Dream. Uh, we're building a grassroots movement led by undocumented youth um, for, for migrant justice, for racial justice, um, trying to get cops out of schools, trying to expand healthcare access for our undocumented communities. Um, and, um, 
And I just want to, and I also used to be a high school ethnic teacher, uh, ethnic studies teacher. So I so appreciate um, Kamora and Regina, the pre presentation that you put together for us, um, because I, we just need to, and uh, to echo what Spen said already, we need to learn from our history so that we can build better movements and win. And I just want to echo that this is what, like, right, these, um, these, these moments, like the Stonewall riots didn't happen by accident. They happened because of a lot of hard work of organizers um, creating the conditions for our people to have the political consciousness in order to, um, and, 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 um, and the collective strength to be able to, to rise up um, and fight back. Um, I, I think also to your question, Stephen, I think that these systems, I think has been, I think Carly said it so well, they're, they're all connected. Um, and so, right, there's no, for me, there's no migrant justice, there's no queer liberation under empire, under capitalism, right, under patriarchy. Um, so I think, you know, to me, it's, it's um, you know, as a teacher, as a, as a organizer, it's our job to always um, connect those dots, um, help young people, um, yeah, understand that these systems are connected and that our liberation is, is all tied up, you know, with each other. And I think, um, the last thing I just want to say um, is that, you know, I think you, at the beginning of this conversation, we talked about this, right, this is a celebration, right, we're, we're in the middle of, right, pride is, a, is, this is a protest, but this is also a celebration, and I just want to talk about um, the importance of art in this work. Um, I'm proud to be a curator also um, of a series, ongoing series called Homeland Security, Coming Girl, um, that's um, you know, in tribute to Julio Salgado, the incredible queer and documented artist, Julio Salgado, um, his, one of his famous posters for celebrating queer and documented artists. Um, and I think about, you know, in moments when, in this work, when I feel so disillusioned, I, I come back to um, art, it's art, it's music, it's poetry that keeps me going. Um, and, and I just wanna, um, the last thing I'll say, cause I know we're so short on time is I just wanna read from one of my, the elders that's, um, really grounded and inspired me, Audre Lord. I want to bring Audrey into the space. Um, and, and I want to read from the Cancer Journals. Um, and so this is from 1979. Audrey writes, spring comes and still I feel despair like a pale cloud waiting to consume me, to engulf me like another cancer, swallow me into immobility, metabolize me into cells of itself, my body a barometer. I need to remind myself of the joy of the lightness of the laughter so vital to my living and my health. Otherwise the other will be waiting to eat me up into despair again. And that means destruction. I don't know how, but it does. Um, so I think about all the, the trauma that we've experienced, all the pain that we carry in our souls, all the intergenerational trauma that we carry from our ancestors, from colonization, from the patriarchy, um, from enslavement, from right, displacement. Um, and, but, but I think we have to, we have to ground ourselves in that joy. Um, and, and, and so what a, you know, beautiful, and, and I mean, we have to take care of each other. So thank you all. I'm so glad to be in your company, um, here today. Um, Regina, I just want to echo Regina was, is, was such an important figure to me as well. I think she's touched so many of our lives, um, as well as, well as you, Kamora. And I'm just, um, yeah, I just, I'm, I'm thank, thankful to be here to have this platform to speak, um, and to learn. Thank you, thank you so much, Varun, and um, and thank you for thank you for sharing with us that expressive moment. I think you're right, and you know, for so many of us, the arts is a healing. It's a healing tool. Uh, for me, growing up as a violinist, it was lifesaving. I mean, really, it was my way to express myself quietly when I couldn't do it openly. Uh, and so, and I know that for so many of us, expression comes through improv. It comes through theater, it comes through spoken word, through artistry, through painting, uh, the ways in which we are able to let off some of that steam, which builds up inside of us every single day because of the pressure that comes from some of the systems that you described, or just some of the day to days around us. So thank you for that, Varun, for reminding us of that. Max, you, you, um, you uh, interjected earlier so beautifully and talked about how your teeth were cut in, in, the, in, in the AIDS crisis. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Max, who you are. Uh, I, I just had the pleasure of having a conversation with you just a few weeks ago uh, to the Latino community uh, about the LGBTQ plus health and human services network survey. So welcome, Max, nice to see you again. Thank you, Stephen, I appreciate that. Um, there's a, I'm 
I'm pleasantly distracted by Echo's uh, ongoing art piece that's going on here. It's amazing, all this, have, seeing all this queer beauty, queer joy, you know, and queer history all on this one screen. I never want this screen to end. Um, <laughs> but like I mentioned, uh, this is, uh, my name is Maxi Stiles, and I happen to be um, the Latinx program officer for the New Haven Pride Center in New Haven, Connecticut. Um, to this day, I believe I'm the only Latinx program officer in the entire state. Uh, we're hoping to change that um, as fast as we can. Um, because uh, to a point that Chevelle um, mentioned earlier in terms of finding spaces where your whole identities can be, could be affirmed, can be celebrated, can be seen. So uh, we look for ways in, you know, in Latinx programming to, to have that space for undocumented youth, specifically, you know, because in any cases, Hispanic, next um latino latina however you want to identify you know these 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 come from places that um that are more conservative you know and so you may not necessarily be affirmed as a queer person at home um but uh but but in other spaces you won't be affirmed as a brown person in in this occupied territory if you will so uh so what we look for is we look for spaces where Everyone's identities, all of identities, especially folks who are the most marginalized, the most oppressed, exploited, and in many cases, I end up coming across you know the the, the the Latinx LGBTQ youth and being the ones that are most messed with, um, whether it's at work, whether it's school, whether it's whether it's home, whether it's many different spaces, and they do not get affirmation. And so, what we try to do at the Pride Center, much to the chagrin of Fox News is to be able to find ways to find those spaces where folks can feel fully affirmed in all of their identities and, and find those places where, oh, all right, maybe not this space, but we're, we're gonna construct, help us shape that space for that identity to feel affirmed. And together, we just, we just it's just one queer family that's just finding that space for all of us to feel affirmed. And so that's something that we've been doing at the, at the Latinx Pride Center. Um, but also something else that I've been doing um, to do with the Pride Center is ending trans attention. Um, if we're looking at the most marginalized folks who are uh, who who are being most exploited, most used as commodities, and uh, and most criminalized, it's trans folks of color who are undocumented, um, and those are the ones that are also dying in detention centers. We have three specific women who know we know of that died in detention centers who also happen to be HIV positive, who did not get treated due to Due to negligence because of ICE, they died in custody. Um, one of them in particular was Roxana Hernandez, who really touches um, because she came from Honduras and she didn't have to come here. She had her own salon down in Honduras, but because the stabilization became so bad in her own country, she decided to come up here to provide for her family. And instead of coming up here and finding that elusive American dream, she found death in ICE custody. And there's so many stories like that that I find and that just fuel me with 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 indignation, but also with with so much you know passion to be able to do what I can for this community. You know, I myself was undocumented for a long time in Fairfield County, as I mentioned earlier, and uh, and growing up in Fairfield County as a brown person, uh, also was trying to find the right queer identity. You know, it's not easy, and I'd imagine it hasn't gotten all that much easier. And so it became, it became very special for me to be able to be in this position and create programming that I wanted to see when I was a kid growing up and, and to create the spaces that I wanted to walk into growing up and, and just affirm the people who I just wanted to have in my life growing up. And so it's a very personal, beautiful, blessed place to be in right now and to be in a panel with who have, have these passions, know these struggles and are part of them in one way or another in the past and present and the future that it just fills me with so much queer joy so so to to, to finish up on the point that carly made about his pride um uh, what is celebrating fourth of july what is celebrating you know uh, our identities you know, i think it's continuing the struggle finding our place in that struggle and, and lifting up lifting up voices that you know like i mentioned robert rayford's voice now we know robert rayford now we can take his story you know his beautiful story into future and understand this is part of our history too and so I think that's part of the work that we're trying to do here. And so I just appreciate you, Stephen, you know, Kimora, you know, Denise, and yeah, I could keep on going, but I just appreciate you all for, for providing this space because it's it's so healing and affirming and it makes me want to keep 
keep going into the next month and the next month and the next month and as long as I can. Thank you so much, Max. And as we come, as we come to our to our time together, uh, the close of our time together, but not the close of our time together more generally, because uh, I think what we have here is a community and it's a family and it's just, that's really powerful. So thank you for reminding us of that, Max. You know, there's the family you're born into and the family that you choose. And sometimes they travel together neatly. And sometimes one has to lift the other up. Uh, yep, one has to lift us up because the other one won't. And uh, you know, it's, a, it's an ongoing complexity that, I, that I'm so happy to be part of with each and every one of you. Um, and go, I wanna, I wanna give you a shout out. I know that you're still working and we've seen uh, your beautiful piece developing right before our eyes, uh, but I would love for you um, to chime in a little bit on your process, where you are, and just tell us a little bit about um, the motivations that really have driven you throughout the experience tonight, the conversation tonight. Uh, welcome and go. Hello, hello. <laughs> How you guys doing? Um, as I listened to everything tonight, first of all, um, this morning, I just was called upon through spirit to like paint a portrait of Bear Rustin. So in the early beginning of the program, when Kamora mentioned him, I was like, yes, like it just fit. To me, he epitomizes everything. He epitomizes resiliency, strength, and doing the work he was doing in the time he was doing it. Um, if you're not familiar with Bayard Rustin's story, please research it seriously. It's important. And um, I actually made a stencil of this because his portrait to me is so important. I'm gonna be doing this everywhere, you know? And I thank you guys for that. But um, I incorporated blue just to represent the flow of everything, you know? To incorporate freedom because that's what the fight is for, for our freedom. And if we go more with flow, go more with love, and I think we can really achieve that. I decided to paint him green simply because of resiliency, like the newness of everything, always looking within yourself and reflecting and seeing how you can be better, you know? Um, in the red, I put like people protesting, people with fists up but I also wanted to incorporate flowers to show that we can bloom and rise above all of that and there's still beauty. And um, yeah, that's where I'm at with the painting. I'm really excited to finish it. And I uh, thank you guys, everybody here tonight. Thank you for having me. And thank you so much. Thank you so much for your visual representation of the spirit that's moved through this conversation tonight. Uh, Kamora, I'm gonna give you the last word, but first Chevelle, you know, there's a lot of healing, a lot of power in this room. Um, so I'm wondering if before we go, you can help us tap into a little bit of that healing power uh, through some of your expertise. But, well, it would help if I took it off mute, right? <laughs> so uh, <laughs> my expertise is not tech savvy. Okay, let's go on and say the good thing I know how to talk in therapies, right? Because woo, I wouldn't make it if I was in the um, tech world. <laughs> but um, yeah, so, you know, I'm, I would like to start um, my share with just um, a quote from a Shira of mine, uh, Maya Angelou. And pretty much um, the quote is, um, we delight in the beauty of the butterfly, but we rarely admit the changes it has gone through to achieve that beauty. And the reason why this quote is so important to me is because as black and brown, queer, trans, non-binary people, we often have to navigate a lot just to exist, just to be who we are. But please know this, if you know nothing else, no matter where you are in your journey, no matter where you are in your life's work, you are beautiful, you are enough, you are intrinsically great. And if anybody says that you are not, you sell, show them to Miss Chevelle and I will get them straight. But thank you again for having me, um, Stephen and Denise. I really appreciate it. And it is such an honor to be in the room with so many powerful people and I and to get to know you all right because I'm a new person here I'm a transplant from Virginia so I don't know if y'all see I have an accent I don't think I have an accent but folks say I have an accent so I mean I've been here relatively new so just to kind of get to know y'all and, and hear all the great things that you are doing across the state and um and also the nation it just really honors me thank you Chevelle Kamora see what you did yeah 
Yo, just so so the fun part about it, Chevelle, you're new, but I'm over here talking to people about you. They're talking to me about you. This is too. <laughs> Connecticut's this big. The gay community right. this big. Make it black and brown. Hello, my people. It is good to see you. Go tell the other one what we just did, because that that's who we are, right? <laughs> and I love it. So Chevelle, very happy to you for for to have you in our state. Like, and honestly very happy with what you're doing with the out ct and i really want to talk about the changes in the movement and what has happened and what this looks like because carly when you were speaking you brought up the the green book right and it's it's really easy to get frustrated especially if there are young activists right now it's incredibly easy to pull your heart and say oh my god you've got to be like ah, right but i'm remembering back to 1995 96 and 97 so damron um so damron there's these travel guides, right? And they've got the Damron travel guide and there's a Damron lesbian travel guide. And I remember buying that because like, where am I going to stay? I'm a black lesbian. I want to go on vacation. Where, where can I go, right? So I'd buy my Damrons. I'll put Reader's Feast on Farmington Avenue, take notes, people. Um, but I'd go up to Farmington Avenue, buy my Damrons. And then I would say like, yo, this is like the gay green book. And in 1995, 96 and 97, I can tell you that white gay and lesbian people in Hartford, Connecticut had no idea what the green book was whatsoever. Carl, you just spoke about it like everyone knew what you were talking about. And I'm going to just step out on a limb and say, because of the conversations I've been having for a while, everyone knows what you're talking about. So that is beautiful and wonderful. And then let's think about how we're growing and changing and why our history is so incredibly important. So if you don't know who Toshi Regan is, you should know who Toshi is. Write this name down, right? So Toshi is this amazing black lesbian performer. She's an artist. She's a singer. She's about my age. She's the daughter of Bernice Johnson Regan, who founded Sweet Honey and the Rock. You should know who they are as well. Anyway, Bernice is doing this um, opera right now that's been on tour for the last couple of years about Parable of the Sower. And if you can see right now, if you're used to what my background looks like, I'm in a cabin right now. I'm in a ca camping cabin because I'm Doing that intersectional thing of being a mom and all these other things. So we are here in this camping cabin and as always happens when I get to these places, I start thinking about how cool it would be to own a campground and do all this great stuff. And I go back to this, this magazine called um, Lesbian Connection that came out back in the 60s and, and was around forever. And they used to talk about this thing called LOL. And LOL meant lesbian owned land because as women, as womenists, as feminists, we had all these weird, strange patriarchal laws that did not allow us to be ourselves and own ourselves and own land. So it was a big deal to be a lesbian who owned land and share that land with your sisters, right? So LOL meant lesbian owned land. This morning I was having a conversation with, a, with another lesbian of a certain age and that co conversation included us saying, Wow, how sad that LOL, that these young lesbians don't know what LOL means anymore. That there was that there was a time when it was very, very important and you would see something in a travel guide and an LOL right there told you that that was going to be a safe place for us to go. Happy that we don't need that for safety anymore. Kind of sad that that's a piece of our history that we don't talk about as much, but very happy that everyone in the movement kind of right now has this idea of what the Green Book is. So as we grow and grow and grow and create space for more and more and more, let's figure out how not to lose what we had and how to put it in context so that folks who come after us can have an idea of what that was. As I say, you know, you, you can't change your past. You know, you don't know your past. You don't know your future. Let's know our past, not make the same mistakes, um, but let's keep doing this. And let's right now acknowledge that this is, we have all, we do these Zooms, right? So we do these New Haven Pride Center, pulls them together, KCC pulls them together. We all, we all do this. This is the state of Connecticut. And this is the state of Connecticut saying, we're not just going to do a pride for everyone. So not all prides matter, but we're going to focus on black and brown queer folks. And we're going to include that weirdo fun piece. So the fact that we get to hear our healing artists talk about the journey that they're taking us on. The fact that we close with Chevelle bringing in this idea of healing, that we understand human beings, we've got to bring our full, whole, beautiful self into the conversation. So the celebration that I'm, I'm stepping into tonight is we are amazing because of we. We are amazing because of we, we are amazing because of we. We are not amazing because of all of these rights that we've attained. We're not, we're not amazing because of all this hard work we've done. We're amazing because we are. And it's so wonderful that the rest of the world has finally decided to check in and check us out. So keep learning from us. And thank, thank you, all of y'all. Have a beautiful evening. Stephen, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Kamora. And I have, I have nothing to say that you haven't said. Thank you so much to each of you, to our viewers. Uh, we love you. Thank you for being part of our panel tonight and for sharing your truth. And 
our relationship as a family. Have a good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Good night.